Years ago, two men sharing a same room, both of them seriously ill, on the long-term rehab floor of a hospital. One man was allowed to sit up for just one hour each afternoon so that he could drain the fluid from his lungs. The other man had to lie flat on his back constantly. When the man by the window could sit up for that one hour every afternoon, he would pass the time by describing to his roommate all that he could see outside that room's one and only window. The man in the other bed began to live for those one hour periods every afternoon. The window overlooked a park. There's a lake there. There were some ducks on the lake. Children oftentimes would be sailing their boats and there were flowers of almost every color you could imagine. And on a clear day, you could see the city on the horizon. As the man by the window described what he saw outside that window, the man on the other side of the room would close his eyes and he would imagine this most picturesque scene. One warm afternoon, there was a parade passing by outside that room's only window. And the thought suddenly struck him. Why should the man next to the window have all the pleasure of seeing what's going on out there in the world. Why shouldn't I? At first he was embarrassed by the thought, but it grew inside him, and it turned sour. He should be by the window. He began to brood. He couldn't sleep. He got even sicker and the doctors didn't have a clue what was going on. One night, as the man in the bed, the other bed, stayed, laid awake, staring at the ceiling, the other man suddenly woke up and began to cough and to choke, fluid congesting in his lungs, his hand groping for the button to call the night nurse. The man watched without moving. Coughing racked the darkness. Finally, the breathing stopped. The man did nothing. When the nurse arrived for her rounds later that night, she found the other man dead. She quietly took his body away. And as soon as it was appropriate, the other man asked to be able to move to the window. The nurse gladly made the switch. When alone, finally in the room, that man slowly and painfully raised himself up on his elbow for his first look at the real world outside that window. It faced a blank wall. They are both us. As the philosopher describes our state, we are all in the grip of a fever. 
and sickness unto death. As the Apostle writes, we are beset by weakness in us and around us continually. The cruelty and the violence of the world is too much with us. The man whose window faced only a blank wall chose to imagine more. And he chose out of love to share what he imagined with his friend in the other bed. And in the telling, he too found delight. The tendency of us human beings is, of course, to become resentful, it's to become ruthless even. Throughout history, we keep killing the dreamer. We are each continually faced with this wall that just stops us, that has nothing to say to us, and we let it suffice for us as if it were all there is. And so it just sends us back to brood, to brood over our own suffering and the suffering of the world. The wall those two men faced, the walls we face, are the very same walls that Jesus himself faced. He faced the suffering of the people he loved. He faced the abuse of power on all the ways the powerful stay stay in power on the backs of the powerless. And he faced the fact that many were out to get him, to destroy him even. And he sees more than that. He sees more to the world than one more reason for discouragement. Jesus lived and died, you see, with a radical a radical optimism, a radical optimism about his own life and ours and the future of humanity. Jesus always had ready at hand the way he imagined the world to truly be and how it could take shape someday and how we would treat each other in it. Jesus, this Jesus, is the model of this deeply rooted optimism. And I say deeply rooted because that kind of optimism cannot be reasonably based on the way things are going in this world. This kind of optimism will never be something we get to reasoning from what is going on around us. It will only be based in the ultimate reality, which we call God. A faith that proclaims that the source and the center of reality itself is absolute love. He could face torture he could face abandonment and he could still say, and I quote, Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. What he imagined about this as yet unrealized world allowed him to stay true, true to the end. No blank walls for this Jesus. And in the Easter Gospel you heard just proclaimed tonight, we encounter women whose blank wall were the trappings of death, a tomb, 
a few burial cloths, and a stone, a stone, the ultimate wall, confronted them. But as they peered into the darkness, they began to see more. They saw life where only death used to live. No blank walls for these courageous, courageous women. It takes a radical optimism to face these blank walls that life confronts us with, these obstacles, these dead ends that are constantly around us. Like a church that, whose issues sometimes we keep confronting or running into, whose politics seem to hurt some of the very people we love the most. Like politics ex itself, which seems to dishearten the strongest patriot. Like marriages that seem stuck in ruts and built up resentments. Like parents dealing with the pushbacks and pushaways of their kids. Like the loneliness of leadership these days are our unfair bosses to say nothing of death and all the goodbyes we suffer. The more troubled, the more difficult the world becomes, the more we need, we really need a deeply rooted optimism my friends, Easter proclaims that there is possibility still. Resurrection shouts that this, that this is not all there is. What the old man knew, what Jesus knows, is that it is not the world that creates faith, but it is faith that creates the world. It is not the world that creates faith. It is faith that creates the world. Faith enables us to imagine what the world, what we can still become. Tonight, 14 young adults, well aware of the imperfections of our church and their own, freely choose to become a part of us. They do not face just a blank wall. The good news of Easter, my friends, is this radical, this deeply rooted optimism. And this Easter night, I am proposing that we take it seriously. Because for the followers of this risen Christ, there are no blank walls.